This video is a brief introduction to Mishtek writing. You are already familiar with the Maya writing from the Classic period. Today we will look at a different system, the Mishtek, from the post-Classic period and the state of Oaxaca, Mexico. Here is a typical page from a pre-Columbian Mishtek book. You may immediately recognize some distinct differences when compared with the Maya writing we recently examined. First, the texts are not organized into strict glyph blocks, but scattered across the image field. They seem to be everywhere uh, and not organized in any sort of geometric fashion. Second, the glyphs are rather simple in structure and often consist of a single image as opposed to the multi-part glyph blocks of the Maya. And here, for example, we can... Um, we can see right here that we have two glyphs with dots. These dots are in fact the Mishtek way of doing numbers. They do not use the bars. Here's another glyph with a line and dots. Here's a glyph here with line and dots. The reason for these differences are fairly simple. The Mishtek writing system was employed mainly to indicate names and dates. Maya writing also spent much time on names and dates, but their dates could be enormously complex, as we saw, for example, in the initial series uh, from Yashilon uh, Stila. Witness the long counts that we saw throughout, in fact. And, and their names were also complicated. The Maya names were also complicated with titles and related glyphs, such as emblem glyphs. Here, with the Mishtek, we have one or two glyphs that immediately relate to people or places, as we will see. For example, the first passage from this section of the Mishtek book is found in the bottom right, right here. The image may be identified as a specific temple with red steps leading up the front and a thatched roof on the crowning structure. Inside this structure sits a large bundle of white and red capped by a human head with a triangular red and white headdress right here. This has been convincingly read as the central temple of Tilantongo, which in Mishtek is called the place of the black and white frieze, much like, and here's the black and white frieze, much like the black and white frieze we see in the bottom register of the temple. Interestingly, the glyphs on either side of the temple here do not name the temple itself or its contents. Instead, on the left of the temple, there is an eagle head connected to seven dots. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Correct. This is the day seven eagle in the Mishtek version of the 260-day Mesoamerican calendar. On the right, the glyph is easily identified as a red and white flint blade. Here it is right here. Enclosed in something that resembles the letter A with a rectangular box here. This A with box is the Mishtek way to indicate that we are dealing with a year name and not a day name. And while this may seem confusing, it's actually a fairly ingenious way of manipulating or using the Mesoamerican calendar. Uh, every uh, year begins on a particular day in the 260-day calendar. Uh, and that year then takes on that name as uh, the name of the year. Okay? And, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, this glyph, too, has a number of dots directly attached to it by a thin black line right here. Uh, in this case, there are six dots which give the full date then, if we take both of these glyphs together, is the year six flint and day seven eagle. 
When, so without becoming lost in the intricacies of the Mesoamerican calendar, naming the day with the year on which the day falls was a way for Mesoamericans to spe specify a day historically. It's as if we say April 30th, but then one wonders which April 30th. But if we say April 30th, 1992, we know the exact day we are talking about. Uh, thus, uh, year six flint, day seven eagle, or actually, let's turn that around so it mirrors our structure. Day seven eagle, year six flint, is closely analogous, if not identical, to April 30th, 1992. It's a way of specifying a particular day in history. Remember that the Maya long count was developed for exactly that same reason, to write history. Thus, the Mishtek, using a different permutation or a different combination. So before we go further with Mishtek writing, uh, I would like to take a few moments to supplement your text with a, a description of Mishtek culture, the Mishtek people, and um, where they fit in larger Mesoamerican history. The Mishtek were not an enormous empire. They didn't build huge pyramids like those we have seen at Teotihuacan or in the great classic Maya cities. They were really a group linguistically united. It seems that everybody uh, spoke Mishtek but who were politically uh, very fragmented in much the way that the Italian city-states during the early Renaissance were politically fragmented. Every valley, every set of valleys had a ruler who styled himself or, or herself in some cases as a king or queen uh, and had connections with many elite families across uh, then the Mishtek area of Oaxaca, which is right around here, and in fact moving to the coast. Now this is, uh, this is uh, close to the area that in the classic period would have been ruled by Monte Alban. However, Monte Alban, like so many classic cities, like so many of the great ancient cities in Mesoamerica, collapsed during the Epiclassic period, towards the end of the Epiclassic uh, period, and by the early Preclassic uh, was as much a pilgrimage site as a functioning political center, although there were people still living there. And in fact, the Mishtek would, in fact, bury some of their rulers in the site of Monte Alban. That said, Monte Alban was not a Mishtek site during the Classic period. That was a Zapotec site, as you know. And the Zapotecs and the Mishteks are the two large ethnic groups, the two large social groups in Oaxaca throughout the pre-Columbian period. So, so let us not mistake these wonderful books and the complexity and sophistication of their culture with a political power and might throughout Mesoamerica. These were people who, in fact, had decided to organize themselves in very interesting ways, in ways in which the nobles all competed with one another and held fairly small areas in their power. The uh, entire area of the Western Mesoamerica, with all of their language groups and all of the interaction uh, in trade and politics and religious uh, ideas, all wrote in something that resembles more of a pictographic script. We have enormous glyphs that seem more images than glyphs in many ways, although it is not clear at this point if there are phonetic, there, there were certainly some phonetic indicators that would cause you to read this in one language. Mainly, 
uh, we think that this lack of the complex, sophisticated writing was not due to some sort of ignorance vis-a-vis -vis the Maya. Of course, the Maya would have organized something in glyph blocks and would have uh, indicated spoken language, right? But it may be that in Western Mesoamerica, with its plethora of languages, whereas in the Maya area there were just related Maya languages, in the Western Mesoamerica area over here, uh, you would have needed to communicate across languages much more often and much more profoundly. And with that in mind, it might have been smart to adopt something that is much more like street signs that don't require uh, knowledge of a language to interpret meaning. It might be, in fact, that the linguistic terrain, the, the distribution of languages, moved these people, like the Mishtek, to uh, value more imagistic scripts, more things that really function a lot like our traffic signals do today. Now, in fact, the Mishtex, and here's a, here's a much better map of um, that area of Mesoamerica that we're concerned with, the, the Mishtex here had definite and close connections with the Tolteca Chichimeca just to the north, as you see in this map. Now, the Tolteca Chichimeca did not speak Mixtec. And they spoke uh, a Nahuatl language. And the, yet the Mixtecs were intimately tied with them politically and in terms of trade and all, all sorts of other things, as well as with the Zapotecs. One, one sees um, towards the east and towards the bottom part of this map. Again, uh, a language very different from Mixtec and not something that uh, would have been easily translated across a written system that is really phonetic. Now, a word on the glyphs. We already established that the glyphs were mainly names and dates. There are some place names too and some other things going on, but in great majority they are names and dates. But to make things more confusing, the Mishtek, like many other Mesoamerican peoples, named themselves after their birthday or their putative birthday, which is of course a date. And so one of the chief tasks of a, the initial scan of a Mishtek manuscript is to figure out which of the dates are really dates and which are the names of people or really the birthdays of people and attached to people uh, as their names. And I call up this slide to remind you how the 260-day calendar works. So for example, Right now, we are on the date one rabbit. If I were born on that date as a Mishtek, I would also be named one rabbit. Uh, so the, if the codices, if these Mishtek books are interested in following me and, uh, and my story in history, then uh, anytime something happened on, on the day one rabbit to me, and specifically on my birthday, they could put one rabbit and it would mean both the date and my name. But if something, if, if they want to communicate something that is not on the day one rabbit, they're going to have to put me, one rabbit, they're going to have to indicate somehow that I am me, probably by just placing one rabbit, and then they're going to have to have to put the date glyph near that scene as well, which may be, for example, the next day would be two water here. So going back uh, to this slide, we see uh, we have a year and day here, and then it's red Stefredon style, so it's red up and then like a snake back down like this and up like this from the bottom right. And you see that with these red dividing lines that actually push you into a particular reading order once you've started down 
on the bottom right. Now, the, the way then you can place this in history is you can construct a year uh, almanac for yourself. And that's what I've done at the very top. For example, uh, we have the day six flint, correct, which is on the, um, the most left-hand column, the second row. What is the next year going to be? It's going to be seven house and eight rabbit and then nine read is going to be the third year after that. And what you can do is you can see them writing history by the way they distribute these year dates. Now, how do I know that the next year is going to be seven house? Well, it's the way the mathematics works in the 260 day calendar. If one year starts with six flint, begins on the day six flint, the next year is going to begin on the day seven house. It's just the way the math works. And if you want to really work out what's going on in a Mishtek book, then you just you list all the events that you're finding in the book and you say, OK, well, this was six Flint. Uh, and then you put the day and you try to you try to designate an action and you talk about who did it. And then seven house here. And in fact, in this particular Mishtek book, uh, I believe there is an event that next year, and then you put what that event is. And if you fill out this sort of um, um, uh, table that we see on the bottom of this slide here, uh, you will soon get the entire story the Mishtek want you to know. So with a, there, there is, I, I got this off the, a very, very good uh, description of Mishtek writing. However, they they did they designate this as six eagle uh, if that if this is indeed six eagle then we have some sort of scribal error or copy error here because this is actually seven eagle but everything else in this uh, tagged notate annotated version of the same page we were looking at is in fact right what we see to um, wrap things up is in fact the marriage of a Lord Five Crocodile and a Lady Nine Eagle. How do I know this is Lady Nine Eagle in the top right? Well, because here's the eagle head and here are nine uh, dots or balls that are the number. And how do I know this is crocodile? Here is the upturned crocodile head and here are the five dots that indicate five crocodiles. So when was five crocodile born? Well, on the day five crocodile. But this is his name glyph. We're not talking about him being born. We're talking about him being married. And so what we have to assume is that this year and day is talking about him being married. And then immediately what Mishtek books often do is to show their progeny, to, to show the kids that they had. And so we have Right here, we have this 12 earthquake. Here's his glyph there. Here's the, the year on which he's born. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven house. And remember, I talked about the fact that there is the year six flint and immediately following is the year seven house. Well, here we have the year seven house. So Lord 12 earthquake and he's he's uh, nicknamed bloody jaguar head here in the in the top uh, right just above him. Uh, Lord 12 Earthquake was born the year following the marriage of his parents. And we can go on and on. And in fact, the at the top left, a person who was born um, on this, this day, a deer, is in fact, and I think this probably goes with uh, his, this is a year date that's going to go with him, uh, this person is, turns out to be the protagonist of an epic story. This Lord Eight Deer is one of the great rulers of the Mishtak in the 11th century, uh, a person who uh, is still being remembered and talked about hundreds of years after he ruled.